Thank you so much for this wonderful invitation. I want to th say thanks uh, to the Wilson Center, to the Pacific Council, and of course to the Hilton Foundation, uh, co-organizers of this event with us at the Migration Policy Institute. My name is Diego Chavez. I am the Senior Manager for Latin America and the Caribbean Initiative uh, at the Migration Policy Institute. Um, today we're here to discuss, uh, after hearing from people like President uh, Ivan Duque, after hearing from members of government from Colombia, from Ecuador, from the United States, from Secretary General Ambassador um, of the OAS, and of course, of someone so important for, for the process of integration and for the process of what we've been working on, several organizations, someone like, for, of course, Eduardo Stein, who is such an important voice in all of this. And today we're gonna have in the second panel a discussion about the role of the private sector. Uh, understanding that the private sector is has played an, an important role in all of this process, but now with the processes of regularization that are happening in countries like Colombia, like Ecuador, uh, will determine a fundamental, pivotal role in, in the process of integration of migrants. Um, if we look back before the pandemic, a lot of migrants were not regularized. 75% of irregularity we, we had before the, the, the pandemic. Uh, a lot of people were working at the time before the pandemic, more than 80%. Um, but with that, with the pandemic, a lot of people lost their financial lifeline and lost their jobs. And many things happened in terms of, we saw mobility of migrants moving to different parts, moving to the South, moving to the North, moving internally within other countries. Um, and now that we have potentially more than 75% of the migrants who will be regularized by the end of 2022, with all the efforts from the government of Ecuador, from the government of Colombia, uh, we have an interesting opportunity where the private sector will play a pivotal role in all of this. So um, it's a time where, uh, according to a recent survey that was conducted in 2021, 20% uh, of businessmen and companies uh, were able, only were able to hire, only 20% were able to hire Venezuelan migrants. Uh, many of them attributed this to uh, validation of titles, to not understanding the real aspects about how to incorporate a Venezuelan migrant once this person was regularized. Uh, and also to other aspects about uh, the, the process of integration into, into, into the labor market, which had to do with uh, host communities uh, and national uh, employees not really wanting to have Venezuelan migrants. So those were the, the, the main uh, attributes that they highlighted. And with that, uh, there is an important challenge right now to be faced by the private sector. And we're here with a distinguished panel of people to, to have a conversation about this. And I wanna start with Paola Wendia. Paola, you're the Executive Vice President at the National Business Association of Colombia. Welcome. And I wanna ask you in your view, what are the main challenges and opportunities for migrants and refugee employment and entrepreneurship in Colombia and in Ecuador? Thank you. So thank you very much for inviting us um, to the Wilson Center for always working with us um, from the Columbia National Business Association. So, and to the panelists of the, they, well, thank you very much for inviting us. So I think that um, for us, we have been working together with different um, partnerships in order to have a, a, a view of what's happening, but also like a set of recommendations that we can give not only to the companies, but also to the public sector and to the academia and to the, um, different sectors that need to work together in order, you know, to pull out a, have a comprehensive um, approach of how to, in, in our case, the inclusion of the, in the labor market. So in 2020, we worked together with um, USAID, Agdiwoka, um, and some of the, of the member companies in different sectors, but we identified that has been working with uh, migrants to see what were the obstacles, what were the challenges, but also opportunities as you um, asked in, in your question. So we find, and you mentioned, um, and probably um, 
something that President Duke can mention, but we need to train them for the specific jobs. So that's something that in, in the different surveys and in this document that is available um, in our website and the websites of, our, of all of our partners, um, we identify from the human resources department in, in some of these companies that not necessarily they have the right competences to and the right skills is the word to you know accomplish the jobs that are available. So we need to work in this matching um, so that the migrants have the, the the skills for these opportunities that are available, not only in the private sector, but also in, in the public sector that now it's one of the of the ways they can, you know, reach some jobs. But you mentioned it's true. I mean, the having um, this temporary permit, it's obviously it's going to change and probably the opportunities will be will be there in the different cities. And um, we believe that working in this partnership, again, with the academia, with the different companies, with the, obviously with the, with the government, we believe that it's, it's an opportunity. Um, I guess Lucas already mentioned how are the numbers and the ages. So there's, I mean, there's really young people that we can um, work with that are probably, um, that we need to work with them now with their, with their permits so that they can join the labor force um, in Colombia. We see something, uh, I don't know um, that if, if you've mentioned it, but also with women. We know um, that we need to make special emphasis in working and working together with women. They are in charge of taking care of their kids and sometimes they can't um, get the jobs they are really looking for. So we believe that with these education programs, we can work with them in um, educating and working with the institutions so that they can get also some opportunities. It's obvious that after the pandemic, and you just mentioned the numbers for women and young people um, in the case of, of Colombia, but not only in Colombia, but in Latin America are really different from men, from the, the unemployment rate from women to women. So we need to have a special emphasis in how we can help them so that they can work and, and at the same time, you know, um, get um, also some uh, education. Thank you, Paola. And yes, absolutely. Men are, I think the unemployment level of men from Venezuelan migrants is 14%, while for women is 36%. So definitely tapping on strategies for, for integrating uh, women into the labor market force is going to be an important challenge to overcome over the next uh, years. I want to go over to team. Team, you lead the Refugee Investment Network. What does your research show about employability, uh, and the potential of migrants and refugees, and why should we invest in them? Are there any success stories? I've, I've actually heard a lot of, and read a lot about the, the, the research you've conducted. Can you share with us a little bit of success stories and impacts of your work in Colombia, in Ecuador, and for that, for that matter, in any other part of the region as well? Thank sure. you so much and welcome. Thank you, thank you, Diego. Uh, and thanks to our sponsors here today. And uh, really, this is a great opportunity and these sorts of meetings are so important to exchange ideas and to collaborate is one of the themes that came out of, I think, the first half of this meeting today. Uh, it's such a massive issue. It's such a massive problem. It's gonna take all of us coming together to, to really make progress in this field. The, let me just, uh, Diago, before we get started, uh, talk a little bit about the Refugee Investment Network. Just to set the record straight, we are a not-for-profit. We are an investment intermediary. Um, we are the first impact investing and blended finance collaborative that's dedicated to create solutions for global force migration. And within that sort of mandate, that remit that we've created, we try to do four uh, different pillars of work and all of our activities sort of roll up underneath these uh, four pillars of work, our theory of change. Uh, the first one is really to be an intermediary to build out this field of refugee lens investing. Many of you probably have heard of gender lens investing. We really feel like the potential is there to do refugee lens investing as well. So we've, we're building out that framework and that lens structure. Our second objective is really to try to mobilize funding through that 
framework that we're establishing and make the investment community, principally the impact community, uh, the donors, the blended finance community comfortable that this is uh, a real thing and that is viable. Uh, the, the third thing we do is really focused on changing the narrative. Uh, I, I really loved what the, the first panelists and President Duque had to say and, and Ambassador Green had to say about changing that negative narrative. We really see uh, forcibly displaced people as a missed opportunity in the most part. Uh, uh, we've talked a lot about the, the entrepreneurial uh, drive that, that refugees have. Uh, that the creativity, the hard work. So in our research, uh, and to your question more directly, uh, our flagship piece uh, was came out in 2018. It's called Paradigm Shift, How Investment Can Unlock uh, uh, Opportunity for Refugees. And in it, we prove, we, we demonstrate, we illustrate through case study after case study empirically how displaced people tend to be more entrepreneurial, how they tend to be more investable in many instances than host country nationals, how they uh, tend to be hardworking, gritty, and as we've heard from Hamilton, they get the job done so often, right? And so we really point to the opportunity presented uh, by this displaced community. Um, so in our work, more specifically with regards to Colombia, we conducted about six months of field work that was supported by Fundacion Santo Domingo recently. And we did, uh, we implemented one of our tools, which is a country assessment. And so when interested capital partners approach RIN, and there is a lot of money on the sideline, a lot of impact capital that's very much interested in this thematic, how they're going to make a difference when it has to do with this what we think is a defining human challenge of our era, uh, uh, they wanna know basic data points, you know? So we've uh, created a market assessment tool and we conducted that in Colombia. And we really, I think have very good news. We found very good uh, refugee lens investing opportunities in sectors like affordable housing and agriculture. But I think what's really important and I think we, we may well find the same thing in Ecuador and we get there and we conduct a country assessment there. But the thing that's really encouraging there is that the table is set, I, I think in Colombia for uh, a, a refugee lens investing initiative there. And we, we look for five elements for a market creation and all of those we're finding in Colombia right now. And I'll just go through those quickly and, and, and conclude. We find that uh, there needs to be market builders present on the ground in Colombia, like Paula and some others. Um, but uh, as many of you may know, Colombia is a member of the Global Steering Group uh, for Impact Investing. And they have a local group in Bogota called the NAB, the National Advisory Board, that very much sees the potential of refugee lens investing. We see that as really good signs of market builders. We also find impact uh, uh, capital offerings also. Our work uh, sought out 87 uh, interested capital partners in Colombia and, and conducted surveys on them. And well over half of those uh, capital partners were interested in doing refugee lens investing and, and the rest were, were interested in learning more about it. So we feel like that you have willing partners there in the, in the capital offering uh, area. Thirdly, um, we feel like, you know, as the third largest uh, private equity uh, market in Latin America, Columbia, re Columbia really does have that impact capital inter intermediation, which is necessary to be successful with this endeavor. Um, the impact capital demand is there as well. I think with tools like I've discussed, the lens, the education of the investor community, the bringing together of uh, uh, opportunity and of the um, the market in general, I think is is alive and well. And finally, we've talked a lot about this today. It's it's the government regulation uh, is very favorable to the establishment of this market. And so we're really excited about moving forward with this initiative in Colombia. Thank you so much, Tim. Moving over to my. Dear friend, Danny Bajar, Associate Professor, Professor at Brown University. Danny, we've 
we've uh, worked on different projects. I've seen your work uh, and uh, about this, and it's such an important voice in all of this. Uh, and I want to go back to to, uh, to something that you wrote on Foreign Affairs a couple of week, a couple of years ago, actually, where you wrote something about agency, uh, which was successful integration requires migrants to invest uh, in themselves, in their children, uh, but also in their receiving communities. So this created like a whole notion about agency, which I was actually very much particularly interested in. In your view, what do we need to, to know or what does it need to happen for this actual investment process to really happen and, and how should we go about it? And welcome, by the way. <laughs> thank you, Diego, and, um, thank you, Diego and, and thanks everybody. And um, I, I, I wanna um, just say something as, as uh, I'm, Juan Viloria is representing the voice of the Venezuelans. I'm a Venezuelan too. And I just want to say, because it's really every time we hear President Duque and the Colombian officials speaking about our brothers and sisters from Venezuela, is very moving. And I don't think you see that in many other crises of this sort. And I think that that really deserves an important recognition, how they see, um, how they approach this crisis. It really comes from, from this understanding that of, of brotherhood and sisterhood across nations. But, but the Colombians have also understood this, uh, in my view, as smart policy. And they've understood that this huge challenge, that it hasn't been seen before in our region, um, it was a huge opportunity if the right policies are put in place. And when I was referring to that three years ago, on the idea that immigrants um, required the opportunity to invest in themselves, um, it really, uh, I believe we are really seeing now um, to some extent, the, 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 the context that will allow Venezuelans to do that. Because providing Venezuelans with a regular uh, migratory status of the sort that Colombia has done and the sort that Ecuador is, is, is doing, and hopefully many other countries will, will follow suit, it's exactly giving Venezuelans and, and refugees more generally the ability to think long-term, to know that they're there to stay, that they're gonna be protected, they can, uh, you know, th think about it intuitively for all of us. Um, you know, for us to send our kids to school, we need to have certainty. For us to find a sustainable job, not our employer and ourselves need to have certainty. For us to become entrepreneurs, we need to have certainty that we're, we're going to be able to appropriate uh, whatever investment we're doing. And, and, and in that sense, I think Colombia understood that very well. And, I do, it, and we do see um, some of the uh, fruits of that. And, and from a few studies that, that we've put together with several co-authors from, from many different places, we've, we found four lessons so far um, from the, the, the first amnesty process that, that Colombia did in 2018 for about half a million Venezuelans at the time. And the four lessons were first, there were no adverse effects in the labor markets for Colombians. So the, the typical prejudice that, that keep countries from doing this type of uh, policies, uh, you know, we've shown, economists have shown this again and again and again and again, and we showed it once again in the case of Colombia, there were no adverse effects for Colombian workers. Second, we've seen a story of empowerment where Venezuelan immigrants, particularly Venezuelan women, uh, 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 increased their reporting of crimes as victims of crimes to the authorities particularly crimes of domestic violence and crimes uh, and sexual crimes. So we see here a story of empowerment of perhaps one of the most vulnerable populations. We see a story about entrepreneurship. We, working with co-authors from Columbia Business School, we found, and this is work in progress, that the minute that Venezuelans get a regular temporary status in Colombia, their rate of entrepreneurship increased by a factor of 10. Let that number sink in for a minute. It, it increased the rate of entrepreneurship of formal first firms by a factor of 10, and it brings the rate of entrepreneurship of Venezuelans above the rate of Colombians, which is something we know that happens in the US, in Australia, and many other uh, places. So this idea that Venezuelans have the certainty that they're gonna be able to stay and invest in themselves, it pays off by, you know, it offsets any possible costs that could happen in the short term. And just to finalize on, on the topic of financing that has come up, has come up in, in, in a few of the <coughs> panels before, um, the disparity of financing between uh, the Venezuelan refugees and, and other uh, uh, crises is something, these are some numbers that we put together 
a few years ago when I was at Brookings. And, 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 and here it's important to think that all this ties together because funding for humanitarian aspect is crucial and it's important these people are vulnerable and they need medical assistance and food and, and all the very basic needs. But this funding also needs to go for infrastructure to create schools and bridges and internet and, and hospitals. And this funding also has to go to give credits to the private sector to be able to expand so that they can incorporate more Venezuelans um, in the case of Venezuelans. And, 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 and this all really ties together. And that's why when we think about fund, funding, we need to make the switch that this is not only about humanitarian aspect, it's also about long-term investments. The conversation we're having here today, Diego, it's a conversation that countries like Poland and Moldova and Romania are gonna have three years from now. Mm -hmm. yep. um, and that's why I think that the eyes of the world are and should be in what's gonna happen in the next three years in Colombia, in Ecuador, and all the countries in the region, because most of the lessons on how to integrate successfully refugees is gonna come from this region. And there's a lot to teach in the world on that. And, and, and I believe the countries in Eastern Europe will be looking mm -hmm. at us. Thank you so much, Danny, as always. Um, last but not least, I wanna ask my, also my also dear friend, Juan. Uh, Juan, you lead the, you're the president of the Coalition of Venezuela. We've been working with you uh, for several years now. And I wanna finalize this panel by asking you a question about what has been missing from the discussion about Venezuela refugee uh, and migrant integration in host countries and how, how, how do we find sustainable solutions in, 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 in the countries of origin, but also in the countries where Venezuelan migrants uh, live? So. Thank, thank you, Diego. For me, it's a pleasure to be here representing our more than 80 NGOs based in 22 countries. Coalition for Venezuela is the biggest initiative for the civil society that is present for the first time in the Summit of America thanks to the support not only from the MPI as a great ally, but the Wilson Center and also the Conrad Foundation and the Pacific Council for sure. Um, we are here not only uh, to demonstrate that we need protection from the host state, but also to demonstrate that we are part of the solution because we are professional, we are athletes, we are artists. As all the panelists mentioned, in the uh, beginning of this uh, event, there is a big responsibility that has to address not only by the head of the state, but also for all the stakeholders. Us, as civil society, we are doing our best to contribute to the capacity building, to strengthen the capacity building of our communities, and also in coordination with all the stakeholders like UNHCR, like IOM from the R4B platform that we are very um, grateful because for the first time also 22 organizations of the civil society led by refugees and migrants are present in this platform. And um, we want to thank to Diego Beltran from IOM, the special envoy, and also Jose Samaniego, the director of America, and of course, Mr. Eduardo Leste for all, made all these big efforts to ensure the presence of the refugees in all these spaces. But also in the level of states like the Quito process, we are talking with more than four, uh, 14 states. Um, in the presidency head of uh, Brazil, like Ricardo Rizzo is doing a great job to ensure also the voices of the refugees in all these policy making spaces. But for us, we are looking for uh, to talk with the private sector, because if we want to talk about the integration, this is not only a thing to address by the head of the state, but also to the private sector, because they have the opportunity to demonstrate that if they want to uh, make sure to include the refugees, include the, the migrants, they could give us the opportunity to hire more um, refugees and migrants in the employment. So one of the things that we want to contribute here is to ensure the presence of the refugees and migrants in all these uh, police, policy making uh, decisions and also to ensure the presence of the refugees and migrants in all the UNHCR, uh, IOM, and also uh, and other stakeholders, a discussion 
to recommend our uh, best initiative to, to be implemented. And for sure, in this country that we are uh, now present in the Summit of America, we want to thank not only the efforts from the United States, for example, for the PRM agency and also the uh, USAID for all the great effort that they are doing to protect our rights, but also to ensure our stabilization in our the host country. We need to work together. We need to fund more the initiative of the civil society organization because we, we know very close what are the needs of the civil society. We come from the communities. We are the migrants, we are the refugees, and we are trying to develop of this initiative without no funding in this moment, without no support in this moment, but also we can demonstrate that our great example of this articulation between the private sector, between the civil society, and also the uh, government and UNA agencies. Here in the Los Angeles, we are a delegation of seven leaders from this coalition for Venezuela. We came from Brazil, Chile, Panama, Peru, demonstrating that we have a great example, a great initiative of integration, trying to uh, strengthen our capacity building and also to know more about other experience because we are not only here promoting the rights from the Venezuelan refugees, we, we, we are here also to know what are other refugees and migrants in our continent doing and also trying to share this experience with other continents and, and, and as you mentioned. So even if Colombia is doing a great effort protecting us and integrating us in all these um, services like the President Duque mentioned and also uh, the President of Ecuador has announced a great uh, amnesty to protect the, the right of the refugees and migrants in his country. We are here also to show that there are other countries in the region from Canada to Chile that are doing also big steps, but there are not enough. We need uh, to amplify the discussion between all the states and I hope in this summit of America, they can find that um, moment, not only to reflect what are they doing, but also what are the good practices that can they do in the integrate and coordinate um, uh, way. Thank Thanks. you so much. We're gonna open up the floor for a few questions, two questions for two questions. I don't know if anybody wants to, Cindy, of course. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Discussions? I don't, yes. Um, Colombia is a country that has something like 50% or more labor informality. So how do you convince the Colombian population to avoid xenophobia and everything else that labor integration of Venezuelan migrants is a good thing when so many Colombians still have informal jobs. Do we hear from the other question or should we respond? Yes, uh, gentleman in the back. Or... Very glad to uh, hear um the voice of um, the Venezuelans on the panel, um, because uh, my understanding is that uh, we shouldn't always have a, a unilateral or you know one moving or one line from uh, sending to receiving country, but we should probably expect some sort of auxiliary effect of what's going to happen in the in the sending country. Um, so my question is, you know, with the uh, ten years of protected status, are we hoping this is going to have some sort of effect on uh, on Venezuela itself, that is to say, on some sort of uh, process of normalization or relations? Um, and if so, right, um, what does that mean for how we engage with the uh, on the ground situation of uh, refugees in Ecuador and, and Colombia, so that they feel that they're participating to a, a normalization of relations uh, of their of their home country? Um, that's, I think, the thing that's been missing in today's conversation. We've talked a lot about how awesome it is 
that uh, we've got collaboration within, you know, the Gran Colombia uh, sort of dream. But I'm curious to see what that means for uh, Venezuela itself. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So we have to make just like quick remarks from, from the panel. Yep. Uh, yes, Danny, please go ahead. Um, <clears throat> yes, because I'm the economist in the group, so. Yeah. Uh, so I think, Cindy, your question is a fabulous one. I think it, it's it's a it, it, it's a big challenge that that we often forget. So. Colombia has even a higher, like a 60% informal labor market as many countries in Latin America, which is a problem that has, you know, quote unquote, nothing to do with the migrants. I mean, that, that has been a situation that has been there before. Um, and, uh, you know, by definition, it's hard to un understand informal labor markets because there's no data or good data around it. Um, but, but, but my take on that is that um, I, I, I think that, um, uh, first of all, we, we we do see that even people in informal markets don't get um, don't particularly get adverse effects from the from 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 Venezuelans um, joining the market. But I do think that here again we go back to investment and and the idea that that a lot of this financing should go um, to investment in these localities. It's probably um, a, a, it probably trans, is transformational for the local economies, also for the Colombians working in the informal sector. And, and for that, it's crucial to, again, give credits to the private sector, something that it's really outside of the conversation. Colombia did something of that uh, very early on with about a, a small credit lines uh, through Banco Dex, their development bank, to areas that had a high affluence of, of, of refugees or Venezuelan migrants and refugees. And I think those kind of programs have to be repeated to, to really to try to also combat the informal market sector. My, my last point on, 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 on what's in for Venezuela, quote unquote, um, I'm, I'm not gonna get into politics, but I can provide for hopefully a positive message. And, and in some of the studies that we've done, um, looking at the example of Yugoslavian refugees in the 90s who were admitted by Germany uh, in, the, in the 1990s and were given full rights to work and participate in the labor markets, one of the things we see is that when these people return, where the TPS uh, expired, they were transformational on changing the Yugoslavian country's economy afterwards. And what we see is that the industries in the Yugoslavian economies that thrive the most, that drive the growth of Yugoslavia, of the Yugoslavian countries, are the ones where these immigrants were working at while in Germany. So all this to say that the best thing that can happen for Venezuela, and I'm speaking as an economist, and maybe also as a Venezuelan, is that Venezuelans integrate as much as they can in the best possible way wherever they are, because all the learnings and all the, 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 the experience they're gaining is gonna be crucial for the reconstruction of Venezuela down the road. Thank you, Danny. Tim, I'll, I'll just add real quickly on the integration, labor integration, and the importance of bringing along the host communities along with the refugees as well. And this is a problem that we see in all the countries where we work, whether it's in Jordan, whether it's in Uganda, uh, whether it's in Colombia, uh, we often lead with the benefits the refugee lens investing will bring to host communities and talk about that. That's a part of our work as well. So it is a critical point, not just in Colombia, but one that needs to be dealt with almost in every country that's been heavily affected by displacement. So very brief. Um, just to mention that um, in our in our strategy, our, our inclusive strategy, we include a lot of um, different population, including migrants. So considering that the, there is a huge informal community, uh, informal population in, in, in Colombia, women, we have, um, you know, so many displaced people, so many, we have a very comprehensive strategy that includes two ways of for the companies to approach. One is what we call the inclusive employment, considering one of the populations of refugees and migrants, but also inclusive procurement. And what you mentioned about the, this entrepreneurship, this is something that we, we think that both the informals and the Colombian informals, but also the Venezuelans, they can work out and they can have different opportunities, not just um, a job within a company, but how with this uh, financial inclusion and with these small credits, they can you know, start their own um, and little businesses. So we believe that a comprehensive strategy is not just for migrants, not just for specific populations, but we can include all of these vulnerable people. It's, it's the good way to approach in a country as Colombia. Last but not least, you wanna? <laughs> 
Well, to respond to the first question about the informal um, inclusion of the refugees and migrants, we have seen how many countries, how many communities has increased the capacity building uh, when they visibilize our needs because the Venezuelans, we want also the capacity to look for benefits, not only for our community, but also for the host community. We have a show how, for example, in my country where I live in Colombia, when they open the opportunities to get access for more employment uh, for Venezuelan, there are not only Venezuelan applying, but also Colombian applying. And we have seen how many people from the informal sector have moved to the formal sector and how all these uh, uh, opportunities to make grow their um, companies, make grow their uh, economical uh, ideas, labor, um, cap capacity in, in their um, communities has increased the presence of not only migrants and refugees, but also returning people. Because in my case, I'm son of a migrant from Colombia. They moved to Venezuela 45 years ago when they find so those opportunities in our country, in Venezuela, but also now they are looking not only the opportunities for, for them, but also for the Venezuelan people, because we have seen how Venezuela, there are not only open uh, companies uh, with Venezuelan people, but also contracting, hearing, um, host community and showing that the integration is the best way to grow together, to um, make uh, all uh, these uh, politics uh, possible in our communities. And for the second uh, question, well, we promote, we defend the freedom and the democracy as a human right. Um, we, as civil society, also we discuss about what is the role of the civil society to ensure that all our societies must be uh, inclusive, democratic, but also um, give us the capacity to uh, um, elect what we want for our future. So um, we are trying to educate our communities in uh, social values, cultural values, to rescue our, not only our tradition and our, um, uh, the, all the things that we do in, in the past in Venezuela, but also there are other ways to do the things better. So I think that the best way to ensure that we can uh, get these uh, democratic uh, spaces is to educate all the people to participate more in this uh, policy, politic, uh, policy making, uh, decision making uh, spaces, sorry. And for example, we are participating in our local uh, communities from the uh, Junta de Acción Comunal, from the uh, Council of the Mayor, and also in the Departmental uh, Assembly and the in the Congress of the, the, the Republic. We are making our advocacy for the human right of our people, but also for the host community. And that's the best way to ensure the democratic participation and the freedom and the democracy in our communities. Thanks. Thank you so much. Maybe just a final round of questions from someone in the audience. I see two hands raised up, but I think you raised the, your hand first. So sorry about that. <laughs> Hello, uh, thank you everybody for all of your comments. Uh, I'm also Venezuelan, also a migrant, and a, the director of an NGO in Colombia called the Barometro de Xenophobia, which measures narrative around Venezuelan migrants in Colombia, Peru, Ecuador, and Chile. And I wonder what should be the role of the NGO sector uh, doing partnership with the private sector for integrating migrants? Because in most of my work, I realize that I work with directors of NGOs and most of them are Venezuelan as well, Venezuelan migrants. 
Uh, however, we don't have a lot, a, a, a big or a strong connection with the private sector. So I ask maybe Juan Carlos, like, what do you think, how we can foster those, like uh, strengthen those links? Uh, hello, Julio. Um, it's great to see you here. We work very close with your brother, Alejandro, in the barometer of xenophobia. And the private sector can help in the following ways. First, investing in refugees and migrant-led initiative. We are drastically, drastically uh, underfunded, as I mentioned in the, in the beginning of my participation, because as you have seen, the needs of our refugees and migrants uh, crisis are increasing every day. And the funds that we get from the civil society, from the uh, international cooperation are not enough. Um, and funding us can contribute to our self-reliance. In the second place, work with us to deliver innovative and public-private uh, partnership. When we find the way to not only fund our uh, initiative, but also to make this partnership between the opportunity from the public sector, but also from the public sector, we can grow together. And in the third uh, place, uh, finally, employees refugees, um, as I mentioned. If you are going to develop a program to support refugees and migrants, hear someone from, the, uh, from our community. Uh, that is the best way to ensure the, the role of the civil society and the private sector uh, making this discussion uh, more uh, frequently, more close. What are the needs from our community? What are the capacity that have the, the local companies? And how can contribute with the a public policy from the government and also the opportunities that the international cooperation are, are giving us. Because as the PRM representative mentioned before, what can we do together to ensure the stabilization of our community? We are very concerned about what, why are moving a lot of migrants across our borders if they are already with a, a migratory status. So we need to amplify this discussion to analyze, analyze where are our local communities and also our local uh, authorities and national authorities doing to provide the information to ensure all these migrants and refugees can access to all these services. So there are a lot of initiatives, there are a lot of uh, fund opportunities to ensure that all these stakeholders can work together for the same uh, issue. So the best way is to um, try to coordinate us, to integrate us better, because as Coalition for Venezuela, we have identified more than 50 spaces here in the uh, Americas continent, between the r 4 bit platform, between the Poquito process, and another um, uh, initiative that are leading by uh, international cooperation, um, also uh, the head, of, the state member of the uh, our continent, but also the private sector and the civil society like us. So the best way is to uh, make this discussion formally and regularly to um, to analyze and to uh, ensure. That, what, that the best uh, initiative and also the needs that we have a show are being funded to address the issue that you mentioned in your question. Thanks. Thank you, Juan. And thank you so much, everyone. Uh, not yet. <laughs> we apologize, you know, the, we have two heads of the state and now one is coming, so this will be a good time to ask more questions. <laughs> um, we have about nine minutes, we are told. So uh, give right. the audience some questions, but make it short so that the panelists can have time to uh, All right. talk more. I, so. I do want to then ask the gentleman, he was raising his hand for... Uh... Thank you very much for 
pointing out all, all the things about these cases, really interesting in Ecuador and Colombia as well. I was wondering, as a researcher in Latin America, I'm from the Stone Center in Latin American Studies at Tulane University. And my question was, to what extent does the cases of migration that we see in Ecuador and uh, Colombia from Venezuela migration are comparable to the cases that we have from different parts of South America, not only, not only South America, in the case of Buenos Aires. I was wondering if there is something that perhaps, uh, particularly the big cities of Ecuador and Colombia, Bogota, Medellín, Quito, Guayaquil, perhaps can learn from Buenos Aires in order to integrate migration in a better and more effective way, keeping in mind the historical background of Buenos Aires, introducing them from different type of ethnic, cultural, social, or political backgrounds. All right, should we hear from the other people who wanted to ask a question? Ma'am, you raised your hand as well. Hi, my name is Renata Segura. I'm the Deputy Director for Latin America, the International Crisis Group. Most of the conversation today seems to me has been focused on urban areas. And we're finalizing a project uh, looking at rural areas in Colombia where unfortunately criminal actors seem to have been more efficient absorbing Venezuelan migrants and refugees because precisely it's not the kind of private sector um, kind of situation like you see in the cities. So I wanted to ask you to give us some thoughts of how these initiatives that you're thinking about could be taking place in the rural areas where a lot of the migrants are right now. All right. Maybe chance for just a final question. No? Going once. <laughs> All right. Uh, Danny, do you want to start? I can speak for nine minutes. All right. <laughs> That's good. I'm a professor. <laughs> um, I mean, no, sir, that, that's a whole, where, your name, sorry? Martin. Martin. That's a dissertation you're doing. <laughs> that's a good question. I, I mean, I, I don't know if I got it completely, but uh, but some thoughts, like probably. So so I think that, um, he, you know, what you saw historically in Latin America, um, ironically enough, you know, I think that there are some good examples of how historically Latin America and Latin American cities played a role in migration. I think Argentina and Buenos Aires is a great example. Ironically, Venezuela is, a, is an example of a country that was, that, that officially during the government, take a look at this crazy story. So during the government of Guzmán Blanco, uh, and the first government of Romulo Betancourt in the 1940s, the, the, the government decided as a development policy to actually bring Venezuela and uh, to bring migrants from all over the world to actually help with the agricultural development of the country, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then, you know, Venezuela was one of the first countries to actually form the, what is today the UNHCR. Um, Venezuela brought, um, after World War II, a lot of from, from Europe, my grandparents were some of them who were Holocaust survivors who arrived to Venezuela because of that policy. So, 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 so it's interesting to see, and, and I believe the story of Argentina it has some similar roots in terms of Italians and, and many other mostly uh, migrants from Europe that, that it's interesting to see how these were kind of the de facto policies a hundred years ago, um, and now we're kind of back in time. And, but, 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 but it's impossible also not to see that um, from a historical perspective, those migration waves in, in, in some of the biggest cities in Latin America were probably crucial to make Argentina, which was the richest country on earth at some point. Venezuela was the richest country of the hemisphere and one of the richest countries on, on earth. And it's really impossible to think that the migrants who came in waves in the early 1900s did not play a role in making that happen. So I think that your question is, is a good one. It, you know, it's hard to convert. I'm gonna leave it here. Um, make, well, you uh, said you were going to speak for nine minutes, so I think I did. <laughs> Answering the, the first question of Martin, uh, Martin, for, exa <laughs> for example, in, in our country, in Colombia, where I visit, we have 42 organizations uh, led by refugees and migrants who are trying to uh, engage their work with the uh, uh, Centros Integrates. Uh, which is the initiative that the border manage, management office is leading in this in this moment. We are in these nine cities where the Centro Integrate has opened, and we are trying to engage the, all the local services that they uh, can uh, 
articulate with uh, all the office from the mayor, from the from municipality, but also with our um, services, because as migrants and refugees, we can also contribute to those uh, uh, actions. Like, for example, we have medical assistance, we have legal assistance, we have also a social economical initiative we are implementing like uh, uh, in another countries are doing our members from the coalition for venezuela but the best uh, way to 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 uh, share this experience with the uh, buenos aires municipality with the argentinian government is to uh, articulate the conversation between uh, the general border management, for example, we have here Lucas Gomez, we have been a great ally for us, uh, ensuring the participation of only the refugees and migrants uh, need to this uh, uh, offer from the government, but also uh, for all the um, ombudsman office but, and other um, uh, institutions from our state. But for ensure that in the social economical integration, uh, Diego, I want to appoint also uh, a big issue. There are many states that are trying to do their best to um, protect our refugees and, and migrants from Venezuela. But in the reality that we have seen, for example, we are very concerned because recently uh, in Colombia, we have seen how um, Venezuelans uh, and also in other countries like uh, Mexico, uh, Guatemala, uh, Belize, um, uh, Honduras, Panama, Costa Rica, uh, all the countries in our region are implementing a migratory process. So the thing is not only in the Quito process, but also in the Afrobeat platform and all these coordinated and art articulated spaces, we have to discuss about what is the best Wait to ensure the protection of the human right of these uh, refugees, of these migrants, because they are human. They are human like our uh, host uh, communities. So as mentioned, uh, the President Duque, we have, yes, the same right of the, uh, of the, um, the local communities, but we are very concerned because not all the countries are giving the same access to all the rights. We are professional that are trying to uh, contribute with our profession, with our uh, skills, or there are countries that are uh, putting some uh, uh, obstacles to make possible to, um, to contribute with our um, uh, profession, with our skills. So. Uh, we need uh, to think what are uh, we are doing to not only to regularize all the migrants, to integrate them, but also to make possible the stabilization of our community uh, with this um, uh, issue. Thank you, Juan. Thanks. Tim, can I hear from you a, a little sure, bit? Sure, yeah. Agricultural part, just to, to hear your final remarks, and thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. So, um, I think with regards to, um, and, and remember, we're RIN, right? Our, our middle name is investment. So all, I, all I'm sort of gonna be talking to you about is like, how do we, how do we get the engine of the private sector running in these, these places? Um, indeed, we, we were created really to face the, the private sector and the investment community in particular. And it was after the private sector said to us, as we spoke with them, you know, we get the why, we get the what, but how, how do you do it? How do you source investments? You know, how do you do due diligence? How do you, you know, create an investment community that's viable? Um, and so all those things that I articulated earlier, those pillars that we tried to create initiatives to support um, focuses on those elements. And so if I could go back to the question that was asked earlier about how do NGOs, how can NGOs effectively relate with the private sector? I mean, I was in the private sector. I had an emerging market role when I worked at IBM Corporation. And often when we interacted with NGOs, which was, was common, it was sort of in terms of like, what can you do for us? You know, 
NGO asking private sector. It was very corporate social responsibility uh, oriented. And I would say that's all well and good. It's often, you know, uh, and sometimes sustainable for, for NGOs to uh, take that approach. But at the end of the day, I think the business community, the investment community really wants uh, tangible, operational uh, data. I mean, when, when we go to impact investors, donors, whatever, they often complain, most frequently complain about just a lack of data, a lack of market knowledge, a lack of a market assessment. And you in that NGO community are so well suited to provide that, you know, to, to provide those, those data points, which I think is, is something that's very important to, for economic growth and for investment in those areas. That sort of dovetails with the response around secondary city, what we call secondary cities or, or migrants perhaps that are in the rural areas and based in often around urban areas, but not necessarily the capital. We've just completed a piece of work uh, on that topic and we approached it in the same sort of way. Where does economic opportunity exist at this level? Um, and you know, we're hopeful that by surfacing those data, by building those connections, by introducing you know, those contacts, we can help to incentivize capital. You can't tell capital what to do, but you can incentivize capital. And um, we think with good, hard information presented to this interested capital community, which I talked about earlier, and there's, there's a lot of capital that's on the sideline just looking for these data to, to build off of, um, it's a good starting point and, and to build those sorts of uh, networks. All right, thank you very much. Fun, fun. <laughs> Are we good? Again, thank you very much for your patience. We are still waiting for uh, President Lasso to arrive. So this is actually a makeup for the first panel because we didn't have question for them. So if you have more questions, and Professor can do a lecture if you don't have um, questions. So thank you for your thank patience. You for time, but yeah, let's thank you let's so ask more questions. <laughs> Just on the on the crime question that came from the international crisis group, um, I, I think Renata, I think that um one just just to be boring and give you some some data that I've seen and and I would love to exchange notes with you. But one of the things that we've seen in the case of Colombia, where I think that phenomenon is much more prevalent, is that indeed, you know, when you when you look at violent crimes, there's really no concern in terms of Venezuelans committing violent crimes at a higher rate than what they're sharing the population would suggest. Um, so, so, so that speech on, on, on crime, like violent crimes in Venezuelans is something we've ruled out based on the data. You do see some, I mean, and this is related because they're, they're, they're working with, with this exploitation that you're describing, I, I, you know, I think that there's anecdotal evidence that happens. When you look at the overall data, there's, there's an important um, correlation that we think it, it's important to mention also in the context of our conversation today, which is in places where there is a, a, a larger share or, or like an over proportion of, of, of crimes committed by Venezuelan immigrants and refugees, um, more than what their share, fair share in the population would suggest, meaning like 5% of the crimes are committed in that region, but Venezuelans are only 3% of the, of, of the population. Those are the same places where Venezuelans are severely lagging in terms of labor market integration, where you would see that they are really twice or their, their unemployment rate is, is, is you know, 50 or twice or three times the unemployment rates of the locals. So, you know, this is just a correlation. It doesn't mean that, um, you know, that there's a lot of processes happening there, but I think the evidence, other evidence will suggest that, you know, one of the most effective policies to deal with crime in terms of migration is, to, is labor market integration. Um, and, you know, there's some studies that have shown that that has, you know, dramatically it could reduce crime incidents by 50 percent just by having access to labor markets. Um, so, so that's my take on that. All right. We're going to have a five minute break right now uh, before President Lasso uh, arrives. So thank you so much. And thank you to all the panelists as well.